This is a 1994 Mazda RX-7, and it's currently listed for sale for $50,000. 50 grand for a 94 Mazda. But then again, this car comes to me from LBI Limited, a local seller of exotic cars here in Philadelphia, and the same people who lent me the Ferrari F40 and the Lamborghini Yalpa. So you know it's not just any 94 Mazda. Indeed, the RX-7 was Mazda's sports car to compete with the Nissan 300ZX and the Toyota Supra and the Mitsubishi 3000 GT in the mid-1990s. But while all those cars went after more power and more technology and, as a consequence, more weight, the RX-7 was the opposite of all that. This car had only 255 horsepower, but it also weighed only 2,800 pounds. It was a full 1,000 pounds lighter than a Mitsubishi 3000 GT VR4. You could take an RX-7, you could put an adult male polar bear inside this car, and it would still weigh less than a 3000 GT VR4. The RX-7 also has a few other things going for it. For example, I happen to think that this is the single most beautiful Japanese car ever manufactured. Ever. It was also sold in the United States in this body style, the FD body style, from 1993 to 1995, only three model years, which makes it pretty rare. And this is the best version. This is the sporty R2 model, which had sport suspension and some other performance upgrades over the base RX-7 and the luxury-oriented touring version. This one is also a one-owner car with only 31,000 miles. So today I'm going to take you on a tour of the RX-7 and I'm going to show you all of its weird quirks and its unusual and cool features and then I'm going to get it out on the road and tell you how this thing drives and then, of course, I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the RX-7 and its status as a future collectible, click the link below to go to autotrader.com slash oversteer where I've also written a market report on the other 1990s Japanese sports cars. And we'll start on the outside with getting in the RX-7. Now, in order to preserve the beautiful body line of the RX-7, Mazda decided not to stay the door handle or the keyhole on the door itself like every other car. Instead, they hit it up here in this little black thing. So at first glance, you can't even tell if this car has a door handle or a keyhole, but it does. The keyhole is surprisingly high for a car. The door handle, you just do this and you're in. Now open the door and you'll find that the door frame is a rather odd shape. It's circular on the bottom and on the top and it has this giant black lip around it instead of body color like most doors. But more interesting on the inside of the door is the interior door handle. It's not just a regular door handle you pull. Instead, if you want to get out of the RX-7, you pull the door handle towards you and that's how you open up the door. Next up is maybe my favorite quirk in the entire RX-7, and that would be the automatic power windows. Now, most cars have automatic power windows, at least for the driver's side. You push the window down, the window rolls all the way down without you having to hold the button, but this car takes a novel approach. In this car, if you push the button down for the automatic window, the button stays down. It locks in place as the window rolls down, and once the window has stopped rolling down, then the button pops back up so that you can use it again. I've been in a lot of cars with automatic power windows, and I have never seen this before. It is really bizarre. Next up, move on to the power locks. This car has power locks, although it doesn't have keyless entry. Instead, you just get a key, and there's no power lock button inside the car. Instead, in order to lock the doors automatically, you just lock one door, and the other door automatically locks also. You want to unlock them, unlock one door, and the other door automatically unlocks. Sort of a novel approach to power locks, but then again, this is a small car with only two doors, so you really don't need anything more than that. Now, speaking of locking, let's move back to the windows. One of the other interesting things about the RX-7 is the driver has the ability to lock the windows. And by windows, I mean <laughs> just the passenger side. So even though this is only a two-seat car with only two doors, the driver can still lock out the passenger if you're engaged in some fight so the passenger can't roll down their window. More interesting controls. In the center console, you will find two buttons. One is labeled security, and the other is labeled overheat exhaust system. When you go to press them, you find out they aren't buttons at all. Instead, they look like buttons, but they're actually lights. Security comes on the alarm is on to let you know that the alarm is on. Overheat exhaust system is something I've only ever seen in this car. I looked it up and it turns out there's a sensor in the interior floor of this car that measures the heat coming from the exhaust. If it's getting too hot, this light will come on to let you know that, hey, your exhaust is getting hot and it might get your interior hot, and so maybe it's time to cool it a little bit. I'm not really sure what you do if that light comes on, except maybe panic, but it's there. Next up, moving on to another RX-7 interior quirk, I like the ashtray because it's inside the center console in a cutout, and inside it there is a cutout, and inside that there is a cutout. You open that cutout and you can put your ashes in it, and of course the entire ashtray cutout can be removed from the center console when you want to dump your ashes. 
Also interesting inside the RX-7's interior, this is one of the first cars where the entire interior is sort of geared towards the driver. Obviously, the center control stack is sort of angled towards the driver. That was pretty common at the time, but it goes well beyond that. There's one unbroken line from the driver's side door to the center console. It really makes this thing look like a cockpit, and several things aren't even available to the passenger. Take a look, for example, at the cigarette lighter. It's all the way over behind the steering wheel. It's basically only for the driver. This car is really, really driver-focused. You could have a passenger in this car, of course, but the entire purpose of it was to drive. Now, next up, obviously, this isn't a very big car, especially when it comes to interior space. There's only two seats. There's not much storage, but Mazda has given you more storage than you might think. Behind both front seats, there's a little storage bin where you can stick stuff that you don't want people to see. Now, interestingly, the storage bin locks, but only on the passenger side. The driver's side one doesn't lock. Don't put anything in there. You don't want to get stolen. On the passenger side, you can lock it, and then that's the vault in the RX-7. No one can see it, and no one can take it unless they have the key. And speaking of storage area in the RX-7, back here is the cargo area. This thing is ultimately a hatchback. Now, the cargo area is fairly wide and fairly long, but it isn't very deep. There's only about six, eight inches of space here. You can't really get all that much stuff. But here's something I bet you didn't know about this car. There's a pass-through between the cargo area and the cabin for the longer items that you might need to put in this car. Now, interestingly, even if you put the pass-through down, you only get about nine more inches of space because then your items are going to hit the front seats. But it's there nonetheless. Other interesting things in the trunk, how about the spare tire, which is under the floor? It's bright yellow. It's one of those spare tires designed to shame you into going to the tire store and get your tire fixed. Also in the trunk are the tire changing tools, so you can mount that bright yellow spare on your RX-7. Now, the interesting thing about the tire changing tools to me is they're in two separate compartments on either side of the trunk, and the compartments are just slightly different sizes, just a little bit different, one on one side, one on the other. I'm sure there's a good explanation for that. I don't know what it is. Next up, we move on to the headlights, and the RX-7, like many 90s cars, has pop-up headlights, but here's the interesting thing about the RX-7. If you turn on the headlights, obviously they pop up and they turn on, as you can see. But there's also a button inside the interior. You push it and the headlights go up without turning on. I'm not really sure why. You can put the headlights in the up position without turning them on. I don't know if it's to admire your pop-up headlights or maybe to clean them. All you have to do is push this little button to the left of the steering wheel. And if you wanted to drop, push it and they turn back off. Moving on to the back of the RX-7, you'll notice you don't see a red light for the brake light and the tail light, or an orange light for the turn signal, or a white light for the reversing light. That's because in the RX-7, they've hidden them under this black shroud to preserve the car's look. I think that's kind of odd. The surprising part is that even though the shroud is dark tinted, it doesn't hide the brake lights or the turn signals when you put them on. You can see them nice and clearly. I always liked this design element in 90s Japanese cars. The brake lights, it's like they don't exist until you need them to. Next, we move on to the logo. Now, if you don't know much about the RX-7, 90s Mazda, or maybe if you're a little bit younger, you're probably wondering what is this circle circle logo on the back of this car? Is it some weird RX-7 logo? It isn't. This was actually Mazda's logo throughout the 1990s, and it has an interesting story. This wasn't intended to be the logo. The initial logo that Mazda had come up with was a circle with a diamond inside of it, but after they used that logo on their cars for a couple of years, it was deemed to be too similar to the French automaker Renault, and so they had to scramble for a new logo. So they came up with a circle with a circle inside of it. Apparently they weren't satisfied with this logo. They only used it for a few years before they went to the V wing thing that they're using now. But this was Mazda's logo for a long time, even though it wasn't the original logo they intended to use. Next up, I already mentioned how much I love the design of this car, and part of it is because it's just so clean and uninterrupted and flowing. There's no weird, stupid curves or cuts like in a lot of modern cars. But if you look closely on the rear, you can see this weird number reflected on the trunk. It turns out it's the part number for the spoiler. Mazda thought they could mount it on the bottom of the spoiler and no one would ever find it. But they didn't count on me. <laughs> And then, of course, there's the engine. While all the Mazda RX-7's 1990s Japanese sports car rivals use traditional six-cylinder engines, the RX-7 uses a rotary engine. I'll spare you the tech details, because if you're into this stuff, you probably already know about it, but basically the RX-7's engine skips traditional cylinders and pistons for a rotating triangular part that looks like a giant spinning Dorito. The rotary engine is highly uncommon, and the RX-7 and later Mazda RX-8 are the only notable modern cars that have used it. So those are all the quirks, and now it's time to take the RX-7 out on the road, which I'm very excited about. So it's so small in here. All right, so this car is 31,000 miles. It's like a new car. All right, now it's real tight in here. My knees are just like barely around this steering wheel. 
The uh, shifter is great. The shifter is like really tight. Short throws and you stick it in gear, like you really, really feel the shifter going in gear. I really love the, the feel of the shifter. These old Japanese turn signal stocks, just plastic, plastic, but they'll never break. This car is just, you can just tell in three minutes of driving, this car is just so much more connected to the road and everything than a modern car. Part of that is because it just doesn't have all the safety equipment of a modern car. There's no side airbags in this thing. But um, you're also just so low when you're right on it, you feel it and you can, you're can you turning the steering wheel and it's heavy and, and you feel like you're, you're really driving this thing. And that's kind of the appeal. All right, downshift. Woo! <laughs> I don't think I've ever been so shocked by the acceleration of a 250 horsepower car. The thing is, it just doesn't weigh anything. It's quicker than I expected, it really is. It just doesn't sound like a really fast, crazy car, you know? I, I floor it and I hear the turbo sound, but I don't really hear a lot else. The ride is really rough. I'm on the highway and this is a notoriously rough section of highway, but it's not incredibly bad. It gets worse further up. This section's okay, but the car, boy, this is the thing though, if you want a car where you feel super connected and when you know, you're know you feeling every little bit of the road, blah, 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 you also have to take the bad with the good and the bad in this case means dealing with a rough ride. At a stoplight, it's actually surprisingly refined considering how it's relatively punishing on the road. Sitting at a stoplight, it doesn't really shake or rattle or anything like that. You can hear a little bit of exhaust, but this car has the only aftermarket thing on it as an aftermarket exhaust. And so you can hear that just a little bit. The only disappointment I have driving this car is I can't look at it. I just love how this car looks so much. I was driving here behind this car in my car, uh, just looking at it and I was thinking, boy, I drive a lot of cars, but very few of them I just, you know, just have such an appealing, attractive, timeless design. I mean, it's just a beautiful look. I really mean that. Cars don't look like this anymore. You know, in today's world, everybody's doing cuts and all these weird little things, and this car was just, it was so clean. Oh man, boy, it grabs. It doesn't quite have the planted feel that a mid-engine car, NSX, or an exotic car has. But uh, in terms of, you know, sports cars with 250 horsepower that cost 40 grand new, this thing is, whoo! There's a little bit of body roll in those turns. Ultimately, it's a 20-year-old car. We're getting to the point where people buy this car more for nostalgia than its actual performance. The cool thing about this car is it has both. It's not as fast as a modern sports car. It does body roll a little bit in the turn. It's not as precise, uh, but this is how these cars were back then, you know? When you drive all these modern cars, you're so spoiled because they've just engineered everything so well. But in a car like this, a little older, it's a little squidgy, and that's just sort of the reality of these cars. It's a different type of driving experience. You know, you, you get a little bit more road feel, you're closer to the ground, you feel everything, you hear everything, but it isn't as fast as a modern car, you know, it, and it isn't, it, around corners, it isn't quite as tight. Now, obviously, there's modifications that you can do to make that happen, but driving a stock example, it, this, is a, this is an interesting look into what, you know, the best sports cars were like back in the 90s and, and sort of how far it's come, and it's come pretty far, but this is still an enjoyable car to drive. So that's the FD RX-7. $50,000 may seem like a lot, but to me, this and the Toyota Supra were the best of those 90s Japanese sports cars, and we all know that nice Supra turbos are selling for sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 in good shape. Admittedly, this one is priced high, but it's also probably the nicest of these you'll ever find, a low mileage, one owner R2. And right now, the average asking price for an FD RX-7 on Autotrader is $28,000, with really nice ones starting to creep into the 40s. In the end, I think this is one of those cars where we'll tell our kids that we remember when you could have had a perfect one for the price of a nice 3 Series. Now, on to the Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, in my mind, there's no dispute here. This is one of the most beautiful cars ever made, and it earns a perfect 10 out of 10, becoming just the fourth car I've reviewed to do so. Acceleration is good, not amazing. It does 0 to 60 in 5 seconds, which gives it a 6 out of 10. Handling is also good, nice and sporty, but not quite as precise as modern cars, so it gets a 6 out of 10. Cool factor is high, especially with an ultra clean stock example like this. One of these pulls up into cars and coffee and you can't help but get excited and it earns a 7 out of 10. Importance, however, is a little lower. This car was simply the RX-7's third generation and just one competitor in the world of 1990s Japanese sports cars. It's cool, but it didn't exactly blaze any trails and it earns a 6 out of 10. Still, the weekend score stands at a strong 35 out of 50, placing it higher than basically any other car in its price range.
As for the daily categories, starting with features, the RX 7 is weak, largely a function of the fact that it's nearly 25 years old and it earns only a 3 out of 10. Comfort is also poor, the RX 7 has a rough ride and shockingly cramped driving position, especially for the 1990s, and it earns a 3 out of 10. Quality is also not great, the interior materials are fine, but not exactly nice, with no high quality leather or stitching. More importantly, reliability is dubious, and these rotary engines were famous for a few pricey issues and expensive upkeep, and it earns a 4 out of 10. Next up is practicality, and cargo volume is surprisingly good. It has 17 cubic feet of space, which would give it an amazing 5, but only 2 seats bumps that down to a 4 out of 10. Finally, value. The $50,000 asking price for this one is high, especially when you consider it's a 255 horsepower 23-year-old Mazda, but I really do think this and the Supra will emerge as the collectibles from the era of 1990s Japanese sports cars, and I think prices have a way to go. For that reason, it gets a 6 out of 10, bringing the total daily score to 20 out of 50. Add it up and the total Doug score is 55 out of 100, which interestingly ties the Honda S2000 I reviewed a couple of weeks ago. The RX-7 has a higher weekend score, mainly based on its appearance, but high pricing and questionable reliability keep its daily score down. And since this graph has gotten pretty small, I've linked to a Google Doc below with the scores updated through the last video different size compartments on either side of the trunk. Just just barely different. Just little little bitty different size compartments. Just little <laughs> Also in the <laughs> So this car is 31. Are you singing? You're gonna... Oh I forgot you're <laughs> you're doing a video thing, right? <laughs>